All right. Yeah. Back on the dime. Going all the way back in the day, though. Yeah. Remember when you brought it up? He's like, can we get a guy from this era? And I'm like, I've got your guy. Yep. Mm -hmm. Straight up, man. This is a good one. Power hitter extraordinaire that nobody kind of remembers. Welcome, everybody, to the Sports Experience Podcast. I'm Chris Quinn with my main man, Dom Datola. And we're just a couple of comics talking sports. And who are we talking about today? We're talking about Mel Ott. M-E-L-O-T-T, Mel Ott, one of the best power hitters in the National League from about the late 20s to the early 40s. For a huge chunk of his I mean, for a huge chunk of time, almost like 20 years, this guy was... Well, he, they started him young, that's for sure, yep. as far as his uh, professional career. But uh, Depression-era baseball, you got to think of this guy, and was only the, I believe, second player to reach a very important baseball milestone. So uh, you want to get into it? Yeah, let's get right into it, All man. Right. Uh, Melvin Thomas Ott, born March 2nd, 1909 in... Gretna, Louisiana, which is a suburb of New Orleans, uh, I had read about. Uh, but he wasn't a very big guy. He was a uh, growing up. He's not necessarily frail, but like when you think power hitting baseball player, like our Jimmy Fox episode where the guy said that guy had hair on his eyeballs. Yeah. He's just or you think Babe Ruth or Lou Gehrig was a you know bigger guy too. But uh, Mel's not, he was Mel's not a big dude. He's just an average sized human being and he's actually pretty small even nowadays but he was definitely average for the era yeah um but just to see the ball come off of his bat like that i think it just was so just like who is this kid well i think a lot of it comes from his uh, swing mechanics which we'll get into later where yep. you don't necessarily need to be the biggest strongest guy to uh, make a baseball go very far no um was uh uh during high school he played on a semi-pro team three to four times a week so he's like 14 years old Playing with just adults and basically like glorified sandlot games. Yep. And he's doing quite well, actually. Against he was these one of the guys. better guys on the team. Mm -hmm. And we know this because we were talking about this before the podcast. They would do this thing called passing the hat around, where if you got a hit or a home run that ended a game and you really won the game for him, you would get all the money that people were throwing in this hat. So, like, he was making money in high school playing baseball. It's like a, you know, baseball collection plate almost yep. you know without the horrible things that come along with it but <laughs> um anyway no um he's totally dominating in this era or um at this level um and uh which totally would have been an ncaa violation by the way you know getting money for playing baseball <laughs> the audacity but uh his hometown minor league team the new orleans pelicans not the basketball team that uh, currently exists um he was so small that they didn't want to sign him, though. They didn't even want to give him a tryout. Yeah. So this is what I found so ridiculous was he was dominating in these little semi-pro games with these guys who were essentially going to this Pelican team. And they were just like, nah, he's just too small. We don't want anything to do with him. It's not, But I mean, he's 5'9", 170 pounds as a professional. Maybe he's a little bit smaller. But like even for that era, that's not like tiny. And it's like, are you watching any of these games? Yeah, I know. Are you watching what's happening out there? Are you just looking at his body frame? Yeah. That's, yeah. That's bad baseball scouting. Is I mean, if you is. guys call me squeak 15 or 16 more times, I'm out of here. <laughs> Dude, you couldn't get a chick if you had a $100 bill hanging out of your zipper. No, but uh, He found a job at a lumber company in Patterson, Louisiana. Um, this was something that I was interested to know, and I know we probably will never know, but he gets a job at a lumber company and joins their team right away. Yeah. I was wondering if that's why he got that job. Was like, this, Oh, it's like The Simpsons. It totally yeah, is. Yeah. Was, was this lumber company team actually pretty good? And he was like, well, I'm going to go show them on this semi-pro team that yeah, I also can get a day job. You he like know? doesn't even – like he doesn't even uh, – like go to work or yeah. he just like smokes a cigarette like out by the john or something like that but uh henry williams who owned the lumber company he puts him on the it's like a fucking beer league or freaking beer league softball team yeah no it totally is he puts him on the uh the team and he just starts you know clobbering people just starts raking raking and like. then yeah and uh henry williams the owner of the company was like this kid's really good and he deserves an opportunity he knows a certain gentleman named john mcgraw the Owner, manager, pretty much do everything person of the New York Giants, the baseball Giants, by the way. We're still in the uh, We're teens still and in 20s. The, yep. Yeah. But um, he wants him to take a look at him for a tryout. Um, and 
McGraw's like, I'm not going down to Louisiana. I'm just like, I'm not going to do it. So Williams is like, all right, I'll do you one better. I'll buy the kid a train ticket. I'm sending him up to New York. Well, that's how much confidence he had in this kid, which is so awesome to see this minor league team be like, no, we don't want anything to do with you. And then literally this guy just be like, no, this kid is so good. I'm going to pay out of my own pocket to send him to the to New York to get a tryout with the Giants. Could you imagine, though, like – just going from New Orleans to New York, and you've probably never been outside of Louisiana oh. once in your life, and just going on that train and passing stuff, like, what the hell is going on? And I'm mind sure. you, he is only about 16 years old right now. Yeah, he's still a kid. He's, in the eyes of the law, a child. But, I mean, back in those days, I'm sure it was a hard 16. Oh, the tw- yeah. 20s. But uh, That's very true. That is very true. I, I imagine 16 was a little bit different back then. So. Yeah. Full beards, drinking beers. But let me say this. He's also small of stature, so he might even have looked 14 at this time. Yeah, he probably I'm shows up and someone's like, hey, bat boy. Yeah. Come here. <laughs> um, yeah, but he came in September 1925. So, yeah, he's 16 years old and impressed everybody, including McGraw, during this tryout. Um, McGraw even said yep. he had one of, the greatest, uh, one of the greatest left-handed hitters in the National League he had ever seen. So, I mean, and that guy's seen baseball since the beginning. Up until this point. Um, so. And this is when he's 16. That's why I thought was so, I mean, he sees him and he's just like, he's going to be a great hitter for, you know, I, because he played teams 22 just, seasons. I was going to say, because teams just did not let players go. I bet John McGraw saw him, he was just like, yes, that's my left-handed hitter for the foreseeable future. Yeah, so. I'm going to put him in that lineup with some guys we'll get into later, and they're going to do some very good things for my uh, baseball franchise. I thought it was interesting. Originally, he was a catcher, yep. and, mm-hmm. and McGraw said, you're too small to be a catcher. You're not too small to play for me, but I can't have you being a catcher just getting run over. Yeah, in that on area, any too. any play, yeah. And just the wear and tear on your body. Oh, but, yeah. you know, you got a strong arm as a catcher. Let's put him in the outfield. Yep. And that's what he did. Uh, signs the, his first contract January 1926. Um, not even 17 years old when he signs that professional baseball contract. For Major League Baseball, not like a minor league. T- He's not playing for those Pelicans. He's playing for the, you know, benchmark franchise in the National League at that yeah. time. Um, in 26 uh, and 27, uh, played part-time just due to his age and due to his size. And um, I think getting to know the outfield more, too. That yeah. was something else, because I saw that it was a lot to do to that. But I feel like he was getting to know the game. And then you remember, oh, yeah, he's 16, 17, 18 when he's doing this. Like, he's still a kid. Yeah. So. Like, he, he might not even have fur on his peaches at this juncture. But uh, in uh, 26 and 27, he plays 117 games combined. Uh, nine doubles, three triples, a homer in uh 27 RBIs. So it's not like bad. They, they're kind of easing him in. This almost yep. reflects the Jimmy Fox career arc. Yep. Granted, Ott's lasts a lot longer than Fox does, but that similar career arc where you're like, all right, well, we have this teenager. We don't want him to play every day, but once you know he reaches his 19th, 20th birthday, oh, he's going to be something special. And 1928, he was. Um, hit 309 in uh, – or not 309. That was the – previous two seasons uh 26 doubles four triples 18 homers 77 rbis hit 322 with a 921 ops and was the starting right fielder so this is 1928 he is 19 years old and puts up a season like that it's amazing yep that's amazing it's got to be exciting if you're a giants fan in this era and he's such a unique player you want to get into his batting stance oh we got to okay so his batting stance, the way he comes through on the ball, he he almost lunges his right foot forward. Y- you explain it better because okay, so it's such hits, a... He's, he hits left-handed and throws right-handed, but as a lefty batter, what he does before the pitch comes, if, before he's going to swing, he'll lift his right foot almost towards his body, like, like really high. Like, I mean, I'm talking really high. And when he strides, he's getting all that forward momentum and his leg strength had to and wrist strength had to be really good for this he like picks up that front leg sets it down and then when he makes contact that ball goes a long way and you were talking about how just level his swing was it was very unorthodox but it was just mechanically correct in a weird way i thought it was uh, it was interesting somebody said that it was a lot like somebody would wind up for a pitch yep where they were really trying to like coil their energy and have it explode out and that's really how he hits a ball where it's like this is 
all of my power is going to come through right here at the right time. Yep. And that's why I feel like he was such a great power hitter, which it was more of his mind and more of like speed of bat and all this thing that we find out later that is important. Yeah. Than just being a giant, you know, hit through the ball kind of guy. So like his, his stance and you can still look at it today. It's his bat, his swing. It's such a great thing to just watch and analyze. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure if, like, and that's one of those where I'm sure if he was younger, somebody would have tried to change it for him. Oh, yeah. They would have been like, what are you doing here, despite the fact you're, you know, being awesome. But they, no, it's just something he perfected. And, like, McGraw was probably like, I'm not changing it. No, yeah. Keep hitting home runs for me. I don't care. Keep playing a good right field. Um, 29 was actually his breakout season. Yeah, this is when he became yeah, the Mel his- Ott that we know. Yeah, he had a um, 37 doubles, um, two triples, 42 home runs, 151 RBIs, which was a career high, Yep, a 1.084 OPS, and 138 runs. And I wanted to bring this up too, led the league in walks with 113 while hitting 328. Which I feel, I, I, I can't tell if the walks record is as big as it would be now because people would be so into their power hitter not Walking. striking out oh, as he, much. Honestly, I think he had some ridiculous stat. I think maybe 10 times in his career, he had over 100 walks in a yep. season. Oh, I think it was eight. Eight, that was it. it yeah. It's eight, and it, there's only a couple of other players that even had that in the NL. So it's such a ridiculous thing where he was a power hitter, but he was a great hitter because he was disciplined on the plate. It, it, he just was a great baseball player. He had a 450 on base percentage almost. Yep. That's amazing. That means basically almost one out of every two times he comes to the plate, he's going to get on base. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's just absolutely ridiculous. Um, 1930, more of the same. 25 homers, uh, 119 RBIs, 103 walks, and hit a career high this year, 349. So his power numbers dipped a little bit, but he's still raking. Yeah. And I think, uh, do you want to bring up? the polo grounds and the dimensions of the stadium kind of right so now. this is something that so mel ott is looked at even though he was probably the greatest nl power hitter for two decades in that era um they were talking shit on like his his thing because the polo grounds was so weird i believe right field was only 245 yards a feet yeah feet yeah excuse mm-hmm. me um but but it was such a narrow It was a narrow little porch, Yep. and even left field was a little bit similar. But the thing was, people all and they said this. I'm not saying it. They would call say he would hit Chinese home runs over that short porch because men of their time, right, Chris? That's right. Men of their time. What they were referencing were short home runs and almost like little gimme uh, line drive home runs and. The, the his detractors would say like oh that's all mel does all the blah 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 but in this era he actually had more like in the 30s he actually had more away home runs than he had home 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 runs but what like i want to bring up though and you're right about the polo grounds is yes you have that short porch and right how many of those home runs turned into doubles or triples because the power alleys and dead center field was like a ridiculous amount of feet away yeah like Willie Mays is the catch, the famous one in the 54 World Series. That game's at the polo grounds. Vic Wirtz hit that ball about 500 feet, and it stayed in the yard. Okay, the power alleys at the old polo grounds were ridiculous. So I would say it all kind of comes out in a wash yeah. as far as his numbers. Well, this is what he said. He said if it was so easy for guys to just to be plunking balls over these the, into the porch, why wouldn't everybody do it? Yeah, it, it was such a great where you're just like, Oh, yeah, I guess it's not happening as often as we think it is. Yeah, and it doesn't matter if it's 247 feet. If you hit the ball 400 feet down the right field line, it's gone in any park. Yep. Maybe except Yellowstone. (laughs) Um, 1930. um, This is when the Giants are kind of starting to put together a pretty good team as far as um, the talent around Mel as well. Uh, 122 runs, 25 homers, 119 RBIs. Uh, oh, wait, no, no, we're into 31. I'm sorry right now. Um, 104 runs, 23 doubles, 29 homers, 115 RBIs, um, and hit uh, 292. But uh, he led the league with 80 walks. So he's still filling up that stat sheet. Yep. Um, 32, 
again, and he's a run, not only a run producing machine, he's a run scoring machine. The amount of 100 plus run seasons Mel Ott had was ridiculous. 38 homers led the National League, 123 RBIs, led the league again with 100 walks, and a 318 batting average to boot, and over a 1,000 OPS. And so, then we get into 33, 33 which is, is their, their best year, which is their year. And they actually have a couple of good years coming in. And this is what I always say is like teams get close to having, you know, multiple championships. It's almost it like a so dynasty. Hard. Yeah. yeah, it is so hard to because you can get there. But to actually win these championships is ridiculous. So 33. The, um, they start off different because they have a new manager. Yeah. Uh, player manager Bill Terry, who's also their first baseman. And if you did not know. Bill Terry was the last National League player to hit over 400. Oh, dang. Yeah. That's cool. Yeah. I didn't know that. He was a great great hitter, Hall of Famer. Yeah. Maybe Tony Gwynn could have, but no, Bill Terry, uh, last guy. Um, Carl Hubble was pitching with his amazing screwball. um, All-time great Hall of Famer. Um, And, uh, yeah, they head into 33. No John McGraw for the first time. Yeah. Which is kind of interesting, but uh, Mel does a pretty good job that year. Yeah, well... Game one of the World Series. Mm-hmm. This is against the Yankees, right? Uh, against the Senators. Against the Up Senators. Until a couple of years ago, yes. this was the last time a World Series game was played in Washington, D.C. Yes. So, yeah, uh, get into it. Game awesome. one. Let's game get into one, game one of the World um, Series, and then I'll do the regular season after. It just starts off yeah. right away. Two-run shot. <laughs> I mean, just to, just to put it in perspective, because he really is a really great postseason player on top of being a a great regular season player but Mm -hmm. literally just starts it off two run shot they go up to nothing game one which and then an rbi single in the third inning yep which they end up winning yeah which i love and then um does okay for the like a couple other games but you want to talk about game five or do you want to yeah um hubble wins game two they lose game three in washington at griffith stadium um in the fourth game um they win uh Two to one in eleven innings, yeah, which was very important because they went up three one instead of being tied at two. Um, and in game five, um, it's a pitchers duel, a very long, arduous pitchers duel. And it's one one for like ever, right? Yeah, mm-hmm. uh, yeah. Game, uh, yeah. Game five in in the top of the tenth inning, Melot comes to the plate with the game tied, and he hits himself a dinger off of Jack Ru- uh, Jack Russell. And they are world champions. Yeah. That was their last time. I think that was their last title up until 54, I want to say. Well, I just want to point this out and why it's such a great World Series for Mel Ott is literally the series starts with him hitting a two-run home run. Yeah, he bookends it. And right? it ends with him hitting a two-run home run. So it's just like it's such a great thing. And he had a 500 on-base percentage in this World Series. His OPS was 1.222. Yeah. So good. Oh, man. And coming off a regular season, this might have been one of his more down regular seasons. Did you not know that? Yeah, well, I saw that he won the home run. He was the home run leader in the NL in 32 and 34. But mm-hmm. in 33, they won that championship. So yeah, he got he a 23 home runs only that year and uh, 103 RBIs. But, yeah, he hit, I think he hit the lowest of his career when yeah. he was a regular player. He only hit 283. But, man, did he come through in that World Series. Yep. Oh, man. Uh, 34 and 35, this is where – this is prime Mel Ott. This is like kind of the numbers that he's putting up are ridiculous for this era, and he's arguably the National League's best player. Yeah. Uh, 34, they end up finishing second behind the Cardinals because in those days it was just an American and National League. They didn't even have a championship series. So unless you won – Unless you won, you, yeah, you, you don't weren't go going to the World Series. Yeah, yeah. it was uh, named All Star for the first time. He made eleven All Star games. Yeah, and then he le- didn't he make eleven consecutive at that mm-hmm. point. He yeah. did. Yeah. So from basically from now until the end of World War II is yep. Mel Ott's in an All Star game. Um, uh, Ten triples that year, which was a career high. Thirty five homers, like you said, to lead the National League. One hundred thirty five RBIs to lead the National League. Had his batting average been higher, he would have won the Triple Crown. Yep. Um, it, that's not to say anything bad. He hit 326, but obviously with Bill Terry in your lineup, you're not going to end up doing that. Um, 35 again, an all-star, 113 runs, career high, 191 hits. So he's 26 now. So this is like the prime, what you're getting out of him. Uh, 31 homers, 114 RBIs, and hits 322. It's just like consistently 
throughout the 30s. That's just the stat line you're going to get from him. And then 36, they go back to the World Series. They do. They finally win. They win the pennant again. Um, career high, 120 runs that year, 28 doubles, 33 homers. Led the league again in RBIs, 135, 111 walks, hit 328. Led the league in slugging percentage and OPS too. So like you're talking about one of the best offensive seasons from somebody in the 1930s who's not a contact hitter, yeah. you know? Like, I mean, an actual power hitter. Um, 36, though, they end up going to um, the World Series and play the Yankees. This is, yeah, where they played the Yankees. And, well, they lose in six games. Yeah. Not much to say about that. Um, and he has an okay, he, I mean, I think he hits seven and has one home run, but it was just not a great World Series for the Giants. Yeah. Especially yeah. for this New York, New York uh, lineup. Yeah, right. The not the Subway series because that's no, not that's, existent. That's yeah. the Mets, but uh, <laughs> the damn trolley series. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, so 1937. Um, they, like you said, they win the pennant again, um, leading the league in home runs again. I mean, I wish they had home run derbies back in those days. Like, that would have been him, so awesome. Like with Jimmy Fox and Mel Ott, and like Ruth, just, and just hitting it out Ruth's just ripping cigars yeah he's just like eating a hot dog yep. hanging out of his mouth <laughs> just like tells him to hold on eats a hot dog in the middle of it that's the kind of shit I wanted to see leads the league in walks again um 931 OPS but they lose the Yankees in five games in this World Series and he doesn't do particularly well he only hits about 200 but he does yep. have a home run every World Series he played and he hit at least one home run which is pretty awesome if you ask me that was one of his uh detractors is that they said his uh batting average was a little bit low for somebody but other guys didn't have the walks he had so it was kind of like that give and take where yeah and who the hell cares you won the pennant no i know like... <laughs> well that's why because people aren't like remembering him like they remember jimmy fox or a or a babe ruth and people were like, they should because he was literally the best hitter in the in the National League for like all of the 30s and early 40s. And I find it strange because it's not like he played on like a second team in a big market like a Boston Braves yeah. or a yeah. Philadelphia Athletics or he played in like a smaller city. He's playing in New York. I know. It's One ridiculous. One of the flagship franchises in the National League yeah. at that time. Uh, 38, all-star again, 116 runs, 36 homers, 116 RBIs. 39, all-star again, 27 homers, 80 RBIs. Led the league in on-base percentage again, 450. Jeez. I believe in 38, he passes Roger Hornsby for the he did. National, yeah, National League, league home, home run leader and yeah. then wasn't passed himself until Willie Mays came up. So just to put that in perspective, he definitely was a guy who put up numbers Every single year. So if you're thinking NL all-time outfields, guys at each specific position, if you're the New York slash San Francisco Giants, you have Mel Ott in right field, Willie <laughs> Mays in center, and some guy named Barry Bonds in left field. If God, I'm trying to calculate that. That's got to be probably 1,900 home runs. I was just going to say, of them. could they get up to 2,000? I don't know. That's a good uh, stat line. They'd be close because I think between Mays and Bonds, it's like – 1400 yeah, plus it's so, probably yeah. 19 so something in there oh that's good yeah. that's quite the outfield oh yeah 1940 this is kind of where you see his productivity start to dip once the 40s kind of start um still an all-star uh well but only 19 homers in 79 rbis um his batting average dips below 300 to 289 um, still at 100 walks so it doesn't matter how old you get you can still have a good eye <laughs> on the ball uh 1941 89 runs, 27 homers, 90 uh, RBIs, 100 runs again. Um, his OPS, though, this year finally dips below 900. Oh, yep. So, but this is where, mind you, he's been playing for 14 years yep. in the league. So, even though he's not particularly old, he's, you know, wearing hair on his body. Yeah. yeah. Um, 42, though, he has like almost a renaissance year for himself. Uh, Mind you, this is when World War II was happening, so there are service members uh, from teams overseas. Well, they were talking about because he was a little bit older, but a lot of the younger talent kind of all went away. Yeah, and I think at this point he actually became player manager. Yeah, player because coach, yeah. that's how little people were around. So yeah. I mean, he still had a great, uh, great season. Led the league in homers for the last time with thirty. Yeah. That's amazing. One hundred eighteen runs, one hundred nine walks. Um, his 912 OPS led the league 
incredibly. Yeah. But I think that more or less speaks to the what the league was. Yeah, what the yeah. league was at the time. Um, 43, only 18 homers, hit 234, 1944, his last all-star season. 26 homers, 82 RBIs, and 90 walks. He's 35, and he's still doing it. He's still putting up those numbers. And he's an old 35. That's yeah. the other thing is it's the 15, you know, I mean, he joined when he was 16, 17. So it's, it's yeah. quite a lot of just like baseball every single day. And then 45, 21 homers, 79 RBIs and hit 308. But in 46, he only got uh, four bats. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and then no hits in 1947. Uh, but so, uh, yeah, like you said, he kept on managing the Giants, though. Um, he managed from 42 to 48, um, had a slightly sub-500 record, 464 and 530, but uh, finished his career with one team. He's only one of six dudes who's ever played for a National League team for 20-plus years and the yeah. only team he played for. So that's some pretty... Uh, it's pr- pretty amazing. Pretty good company that yeah. he's in. And I uh, just wanted to go over his career stats. Um, career 304 batting average. 2,876 hits, 1,860 RBIs, 1,708 walks, an OPS career of 947, which could have been close to 1,000 if he didn't have those like last years yes, at the very definitely. end. definitely. And then the big number, the most important number, 511 home runs. First National Leaguer to hit 500 home runs, nobody can take that away from him, which is pretty awesome. Something that I, I uh, thought was interesting that you never think about, but in that era, uh, the National League and American League actually played with two different balls. Yeah, and they were oh, talking yeah. about the American League had a, a it had a much more of a of spring off of that bat. So yeah. I'm just saying, like the Lace the national wound is tight. Yeah, the National League's ball was a lot fucking harder to hit out of a park. And they were talking about this. They were like, "Well, the Polo Grounds was easier to hit out of," and they were like, "Well, they are." hitting harder balls and like there's yeah. all this stuff that you have no idea and you can't really equate but the only thing that i will stand true is he is without a doubt one of the three greatest hitters of this era and probably one of the greatest national league hitters ever oh absolutely the 500 speaks for itself oh it always does it just yeah that's where it is that's the number you need to look at and if you want to get even deeper to see how special he was you look at the walks you look at the runs scored you look at the 480 doubles that he had. The thing that I love was he has almost the exact same run scored as RBIs. And you're just like, oh, he's getting on base because he's a power hitter. So you're like, he's just driving shit in. No, he's getting on base and coming around too. And that's what I love. Yeah, his career on base percentage of 414, that's ridiculous. Yeah. 40% of the time you go to the plate, you're going to end up on first base. <laughs> The Safely. A's would love him so yeah, hard. Oh, Billy Bean. I yep. mean, I'm not saying Mel Ott is a masturbatory aid for Billy Bean, but there's a good chance he probably is. Oh, 100%. But, uh, yeah, great discipline at the plate. Led the NL in homers six times. Um, and from 28 to 45, I wanted to bring this stat up. He led the team in home runs and RBI, or in home runs. In home runs. Yeah. No, no other, player's done yeah. that in the history of Major League Baseball. Has it, ever it, led their team for 20 years in a single triple crown uh, stat. And he, he led the Giants. 18 years. 18 years, yeah. Who has a career that lasts 18 years to begin with? Let alone dominating a home run stat for 18 years. Yeah, it's insane. Totally. Oh, it's crazy. Um, but after his career uh, as manager, uh, he worked in the farm system for Carl Hubble in 1951 and managed the Oakland Oaks of the old Pacific Coast League. Yep. Uh, 1952, they won over 100 games, but sadly finished in second place. <laughs> um, in 1951, though, that's the big year for him. Uh, elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame, which... Obviously. Know, easy. Yeah. Obviously. Belongs in there. Uh, number four was retired by the Giants when he was still managing them. Oh, yeah. In 1948. I yep. think that's so cool. Um, and uh, yeah, only one of six NFL or, and National League players, sorry, um, to uh, spend 20 plus years with one team. Yeah. And then uh, after his kind of, you know, career with minor league baseball, he gets a job in broadcasting. Yeah, well, job in he actually takes a couple of years away from baseball, yeah. and they said it was the first time in like 30 years that he would take time away from professional baseball, various, you know. Well, if you think about it, he, from the time he was 15, 16 yeah. years old, 
his entire life has just been ba- he's like a baseball lifer. Yeah. And, um, uh, yeah. He goes back to doing announcing games. So before they were, they could really televise them live. They would get all of the stats and almost do it like uh, in major league. Where yeah, he, exactly. He, he hits the yep. thing and he's like, Boop, oh, there's <laughs> another hit. So it was <laughs> him the and, bat. Yeah, it was him and this other guy for I think like Van two Patrick. Or, yeah, Van Patrick. The Detroit Tigers. Yeah, yeah. for uh, two or three years, and they were doing it. And then to fifty eight. Yeah, tragedy struck, which. This is what's really unfortunate because maybe he would have been remembered more yeah. if he had lived because he would have come out for like old timers games and they would have done like lists and stuff like they do now. The he could have been hitters. he could have been somebody's announcer for like thirty years. I'm sure he would have worked his so, way to San Francisco for something because yep. by that time they had moved uh, in '58. Actually, yeah, so it was a year after or the year that they the moved year, yeah. to San Francisco. Um, November 21st, 1958, uh, he died from injuries sustained in a car crash in Bay St. Louis, Mississippi. Yeah. A, uh, he died drunk, in New Orleans eventually. But a yeah. drunk driver ran into him, 59, died a week after of it, from his injuries. He was 49 so. years old when he died. That's amazing. Yeah. And it probably in great shape for somebody of that era. Yeah. You know? I mean, they don't make them like they do back in the day. But, yeah, it, what a sh- horrible way to go. I know. Like, just a tragic loss of life and someone who could have given back more to the game, which I'm sure he wanted to do. Yeah, he could have gone in, back into managing or announcing, and we probably would be talking about him more frequently than we do, which we should be talking about him more because he was such an amazing, amazing player. That's why I like this podcast, because, you know, we talk about these guys that were so good, but, like, are kind of tucked away a little yeah, bit. Yeah, you forget about them a little bit. But uh, Last thing I wanted to bring up um, is since 1959, the year after he died, the National League, because he left led them six times in home runs during his career. Their uh, home run champion award is named after Mel Ott. Yep. So that's how important this guy is. Go look him up. He's really interesting and just a, almost a freak of nature to watch. And please don't drink and drive. Yes. <laughs>